excited to have Mike Donahue in service with us this morning. Mike has been a great friend over the years, and uh, he brings a lot of energy, and I know that you guys are going to enjoy his ministry this morning. And so I want Mike to come and give you the full brunt of what he has. So hang on, get ready, because it's going to be fun. Well, maybe not. I love you, man. Good morning. It's good to be back here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were yesterday, we were at a retreat in, uh, what was the name of that town, Craig? Chewy, Oklahoma. How many of you have ever been to Chewy, Oklahoma? How many of you have ever heard of Chewy, Oklahoma? Yeah, we didn't either, and we were really scared. We didn't think we were coming out of there, actually. It was pretty crazy. Uh, my name is Mike Donahue, and I am, uh, I'm a motivational speaker, but uh, prior to that, I was a youth pastor for 20 years um, in, in the Assemblies of God ministry at five different Assemblies of God churches. Um, I have, uh, about 2004, um, I started a school assembly program um, going into public schools because I wanted to um, bring a message of hope to public schools. Um, and so basically that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 12, 13 years. I'm partnering with a guy named Craig Scott. Craig is sitting over here. He's going to get up and talk a little, in a little bit. Craig is, um, it was a Columbine survivor. He was in the library at Columbine High School. His sister actually uh, uh, was uh, passed away, Rachel. Uh, she was the first one that was shot. There's a movie coming out actually in uh, October 21st called Unashamed that uh, chron chronicalizes the life of Rachel in uh, the whole, kind of the whole thing, but m m focused on, on Rachel. And so um, you've been looking for that. It's a Christian movie. Uh, Rachel had a, a real strong faith and Craig's going to talk about that a little bit. But what I want to talk about this morning, I'm only going to talk for about 15 minutes. I'm going to give it to Craig. And you're going to be very glad that I did that because Craig has a powerful story. I'm going to pray first. Is that okay? Is it okay if we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk and be able to um, share how faithful and how awesome you are. And I pray that during these times, um, the, the times that we're in right now, that you would raise up a generation of young people um, and, and old people, just people, that would, um, their faith would be stronger than the circumstances. Our faith would be stronger than whatever's going on on Fox News right now. Our faith and our, our belief in, in what you, who you are and what you're doing in our lives is way bigger than whatever the circumstances are in the world. And we don't want to be ignorant to it, but we also don't want to be fearful of it. And so we ask, Lord God, that you would, um, you would just bring a strong message of hope today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I was in the military, I was in the Air Force, and I, I was in basic training, and I was sitting in basic training, um, and they... they they invited the, our squadrons to sit and listen to and be recruited by a special forces team in the Air Force called Pararescue. How many of you have ever heard of Pararescue? So Pararescue is like the Navy SEALs of the Air Force, except their mission is specifically to, to go in behind enemy lines and rescue down soldiers. Um, that's, that's their thing. And, I, and they get up and talked about it. And I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I was in basic training for about 10 days when, when we went into this, um, this meeting. And so for 10 days, I've watched soldiers, right? I've watched Air Force soldiers. We had, a TI, we had two TIs, and they looked pretty, pretty rough and pretty bad. I mean, they were like as far as, um, I mean, they were trained guys, right? And, and so, you know, you had this, this fear of, of, these, of these, uh, these soldiers that were, you know, tough guys. And, and, and it was awesome, right? But then when these two guys, these pararescue guys walked in the room, I had seen nothing like that. Like I, I walked, these guys walked in the room, and there was a, difference between anybody I've seen and these two guys. When they walked in the room, first of all, they were, they were huge, and they were cut like rocks. I mean, they, their uniforms fit perfect. Their, 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 uh, their pants were blouse, so you could see their shiny black shoes, and they had, uh, they had red bandanas with an insignia on the, banner, on, the, on, the, uh, on their the beret that said that others may live. Their motto for pararescue was that others may live. I want you to say that with me, that others may live. So I, I was, I was take, right away, I was like, whoa, what is going on? These guys were just incredibly fit and, and very impressive. And so I, I listened. And then they showed a movie. And when they showed the movie, they showed, they showed this movie of this down soldier 
that was, that was in Vietnam. Now, this was probably 1981, so this was a pretty fresh movie, I mean, relatively speaking. So th this guy was, um, w was rescued. He was, he was shot down. He was on a Phantom uh, aircraft, and he was shot down behind enemy lines. And he was narrating the movie on the helicopter after he was rescued. So this guy was, was just, just got rescued. And it wasn't something in a studio. It, wasn't, it, was, it was very raw footage of this guy talking about what it was like to be rescued. And I sat there in that room. And I wasn't a Christian at the time. But I sat there in that room and my knee was just shaking. I was like, I, I want to do this. I want to go behind enemy lines. And I want to help people that, that have no hope. And I, and I wasn't a Christian. This wasn't anything. This wasn't a... a, a you know, a, a spiritual message. This was really, I wanted to do that. I wanted to go and, and help. So I signed up. And when I signed up, you had to pass a test. You had to pass an academic test and you had to pass a physical test. And the physical test was, um, just to get into the indoctrination course, you had to do so many push-ups, so many, um, so, so, you had to run a mile and a half in combat boots at a certain time. You had to, uh, and then you had to swim. You had to swim a mile. And so only two of us made it out of like, there was probably 30 guys that morning that tried out on a Saturday morning, and two of us made it, three of us made it, and one didn't make the academic test, so two of us made it into the school. When you got into the school, um, it was 45 minutes, I mean, I'm sorry, 45 guys that went into it, 45 guys, um, but only eight make it through. And when you, when you make it through, after you make it through, you go to scuba school, you go to uh, medical training, you go, you go to all these schools, and then and if you make it through that, then you're a pararescue man. You get the beret, and you get to go and do that. I was so excited. I was so excited because I, I wanted to do it. Well, I did it, and I got in. I made it to the indoctrination course. I made it through Hell Week. They had a week that was, it was crazy. They killed us. I mean, they did things to us physically that were, I mean, I don't know if they can do that anymore. Like, it was bad. Like, we had, to, we, we had this one walk we had to do. We had to do this duck walk, and we had to, like, walk around these aircraft like this and go, quack, quack, and, like, it was totally humiliating, right? And one guy, you could quit. By the way, you could quit anytime you wanted to, right? So, so, you, so basically, this guy was going around the airplane, and he was quacking, like all of us, right? He lost his mind. He just started going that way and quacking, like he just quacked all of, well, he just kept quacking, right? <laughs> and he was gone, right? And so he quit, right? There was one, one uh, during Hell Week, there was one situation where they, they put you underwater. They, so they have the, um, the instructor in the pool with you, and you go underwater. You're, you're underwater. And then you, have, you and your buddy have to, have to share a snorkel. That sounds good, right? Everything's good. So we're sharing the snorkel. I take a breath. You take a breath, right? All of a sudden, he takes a snorkel. But you can't come up. If he, you come up, he hits you in the head with a snorkel. He's huge, right? So that hurts. And so you think you're going to drown, right? So guys would freak out. I mean, I, I made it because I just, they can't kill me. I kept telling my head, they can't kill me, right? You know, they're going to go to jail if they kill me. So I, I just like tried to do my best, you know, take a breath as I come up. He's <clears throat> hit me with it. And, but one guy, he was the, the best guy. Like we were all jealous of this guy because he was, he was just a great athlete. We thought he was for sure he's going to be one of the eight. As soon as that happened, he, went, he, just, he just sank to the bottom of the pool swam to the shallow end, and that was it. He went home, right? He was done. He quit right there. So there was, there, there was, a, there was a, uh, a real intensity on the training, and really what it came down to, what I liked about it, and I ended up getting out. I didn't make it through the, through the eight-week indoctrination course. I was like, I was thinking it was like 20 guys left, so I did, I did pretty good. Clap for me, because I did pretty good, all right? But fast forward to... to, to um, to, to Bellevue Christian Center. I got stationed off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. Long story short is I gave my heart to Christ. It started like this. A really pretty girl that went to the church came up to me and said, would you like to go to church with me? I said, I would go to hell with you. I really would. Like, I, 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 would, I would join a cult. I'll do whatever you want. I'll drink the Kool-Aid. I'll shave my head. You are beautiful, right? So God uses all kinds of things, right? So I go to church. I get saved. So then they started pumping me with Christian music, right? They started, hey, because I listened to Led Zeppelin. I listened to, you know, the Rolling Stones and blah, all that stuff. So they're like, hey, don't, you know, you don't want to listen to that anymore. Here's some new stuff, right? So they give me Petra, right? <laughs> Red is the color that the blood that flows. Okay, whatever. And then, and then they gave me Larry Norman. I'm not even going to quote those, those. I mean, Larry Norman. How many of you guys remember Larry Norman? I don't, I don't know what happened to that guy, but wow, there's some pretty crazy stuff. Well, I'll just tell you one of, the, one of the song titles. I won't go the rest of it. Okay, I won't. All right. So it, it was it, bad. So 
so I'm listening to this music, and, and you know, you, good stuff, right? But one song in particular that, you know how you, there's a song, it doesn't matter how ridiculous it is, it, it, it like, it just gets in your soul. Anybody have songs like that? It just gets in your soul, right? Well, one, the song that gets in my soul is by Steve Camp. And I love Steve Camp. I, I still listen to Steve Camp, right? I don't even know where he is. I, I, I have no idea. But I, I listen to him because the one song that I really love by Steve Camp, it goes like this. It's called Run to the Battle. It starts out like this. Some people want to live within the sound of chapel bells, but I want to run a mission a yard from the gates of hell. And everywhere you meet, everyone you meet, take them the gospel and share it well. And look around as you hesitate because another soul just fell. Let's run to the battle. That's my heritage in Christ. I remember having intense prayer times over that song lyric. Like, I remember crying my eyes out for the lost over that song lyric. God, I don't want to live in the sound of chapel bells. I don't want to be comfortable. I want to go where you are. I want to go where you are. So I was a youth pastor, and I loved it. And we, we, we you know, we got a lot of kids that were out of the streets. And I mean, I'm not going to go into all this, because I, but... But bottom line, we did. We did that. We did that. We went and we got kids that were not your typical church kids, and we got them saved. We had people smoking in the parking lots. We had, we had, fight, we had to break up fights. And, and every time we had a retreat, we, had to, we, had, we called it lip patrol. We had to have guys go out and make sure people weren't making out in the trees and stuff. So, I mean, but you know what? That's what I loved. I loved having that raw, you know what I mean? Like, if we're just having church for church people, what's the, what's the use of that? Amen. Let's, let's go get them. Let's go get them. Let's go behind enemy lines and get them. And that was good for a while. And I love being a youth pastor and, and, I, and I, I love doing that. But I kept, I, I met a guy named Reggie Dabbs and Reggie Dabbs speaks in school. You might have had Reggie here a few times. Reggie, Reggie's in my church today. Reggie's at my church in Denver, Colorado right now. And I mean, this morning he's at my church and I'm here with you and I love that. But, um, but bottom line is, I, I went to a couple schools with him and I saw the faces of kids and the pain and the hurt and I went, I, I got to do this. So we started taking our master's commission teams into, into schools, and we started talking about, you know, don't do drugs and all the, the typical stuff. But the more we started to do it, the more we realized that really what's going on today is young people don't value themselves. They really don't value themselves. And yeah, we can go in and talk about bullying and all that stuff, but bottom line is this, is, is I think it's a waste of time to go into a school and tell a kid that he needs to value other kids when he doesn't value himself, Amen. And the Bible says in the last days, there'll be, there'll be all kinds of tre treacherous things going on. But the one thing that, that just sticks to me is that there will be a society without love. Are we seeing that? Amen? And the tragedy of that is that you've got victims of that. If I told you right now uh, some of the stories that I have heard, that I have heard as a, as a youth minister going into public schools, I probably couldn't say half of them in this church because you'd be offended. And I understand that, and it's probably not appropriate. But there are times that I walk out of, the, walk out of that school, and I sit in the car, and I, and I, or, or the van, or whatever, and I just I take a deep breath and go, I don't know how these kids do it. I don't know how they get up in the morning, after some of the stories I've heard. There are times, I, just, I was in Duluth, Minnesota, two days ago. I'm at a, I was at a foster care. I do it every year. 12 years I've been doing this. I do, it's my favorite, favorite, favorite place to speak. It's the hardest place to speak because these kids, it's a foster care age out. They're aging out of the, out of the system. And, and so they're, these kids have made it. You know, they're, they're, they, you can't go unless you have a high school diploma. So these kids are, are, are they're, they're tough, but they've got mileage on them. They've got, they've got bruises. They've, they've, they're broken. They've got, they've got stories. And some of the best stories or the most tragic stories that I have are out of that conference. And I was just there. And, and we taught them the value up concept. We're, 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 unrolling, we're unleashing this year a new, a new system in schools called value up. And that's why Craig's with me and I'll explain that in a minute. But, but when people realize how valuable they are, you, you act valuable. The advantage that we have in the church is that you, you, just sat, you just stood there in this church a few minutes ago and sang that song. He's a good, good father. It's, it's, it's who he is. It's who he is. And then you sang... He, and I'm loved by him. And that's who I am, because that's your identity. That's your identity. You know you're loved by God. If you don't know that, let me clue you in. You are absolutely loved by God. And it was the sacrifice on the cross. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with what you, your personality. It has nothing to do with, with, with what you've done or have not done. Jesus Christ paid that price on the cross. And that made you a child of God. Amen? 
And that makes you blameless. So you can sing that song with confidence. I am a child of God. I am loved by him. But then you go to a public school and those kids don't know that. They don't know that he's loved by God, that they're loved by God. They don't know that. And they act accordingly. They act accordingly. They act like they're not valuable. They put things in their body. They do things to other people. They medicate themselves because, because they're hurting. We gotta get the message of hope to the, to, the, to the public schools. Craig and I speak in public schools all year long. And you know what? We are missionaries we are missionaries to a closed nation. It's a closed nation. They're telling us we cannot preach the gospel in public schools. It's the very thing they need. It's the very thing they need. But we, we can't do it. But we can do it. We do do it. We do it. We do it. We can't, we can't say Jesus loves you, but we, we can say other things that they know. And we get, we get the message across. And we need you. We, we need the body of Christ to cover us. One of the things that, I'm going to close with this, one of the things that I loved about that video when I saw those Vietnam vets, um, those Vietnam soldiers behind enemy lines, when I saw what they do, you know what they said in the video? They said three times. They said when an enemy, when, when a soldier gets trapped behind enemy lines, they, say every, they said it three times in the video, everything stops. Everything stops and the mission becomes about getting, getting them behind the line. Remember the scripture where Jesus said, I left the 99 and I went for the one. I mean, great, this is a great church, right? But, but man, there's people behind enemy lines. That, that, that we're, we're the 99. We're, the, we're safe, we're good, we're good. And praise God, praise God, amen, that we're good? Are you good? Yeah. Praise God we're good. Praise God we're, we're, we're with the sheep, we're eating, right? They're shearing us once in a while, taking off our, whoo, you know, we're, whoo, we're sheep, right? We're, we're good. But there's, there's, a, there's a couple of them out there that, that are gone now. And they're hurting they're behind enemy lines. And when I saw that, I saw what they did was they showed these. Soon, as soon as a soldier goes down, as soon as one of the nine, the, the one goes out, the 99 go into action. The 99 go, oh, we got to do something. So they send, they send Hueys up, two, two big helicopters, right? They send A-10 anti-tank air, aircraft. They send, a, they send a C-130 up. And it, it, it's the eyes in the sky. It just makes sure there's no enemies coming near them. And then anything that comes near that soldier... They just blow them up. They, they, don't, they don't ask for permission. They don't call the president and go, can we kill this guy? They just go, he's dead. He's near one of our guys. We're killing him. I'm sorry, I'm a Republican. So. But bottom, bottom line is this. Is, I like that stuff. So, so bottom line is this, is, is, is we need to cover. Craig and I need to cover. Because we're going in. You can't go in. Don't go in. Don't go speak in public schools, okay? Let us do that. We'll do that, okay? But we need to cover. We need you. We need you to pray for us. We need you to invest in us. We need you to care about us. We, and that's one of the reasons I love coming here because Kelly puts his money where his mouth is. He has helped us tremendously. I mean, his, and, and just being my friend is, is cover enough, but he's done more than that. And, and I just appreciate your church and I appreciate um, who you are as a church. You're the 99 that do it right. And I love you for that. And I, I appreciate coming here. My friend Craig Scott's coming up in a few uh, now. And um, he's... <laughs> No, come on up, come on up. He's, he's, we've become, I've known him for years. He actually wrote the, the, uh, the, co the uh, forward to my book, Value Up, and uh, his story is tremendous. He was, in the, he was in the library at Columbine High School and, when the tragedy happened, and his sister passed away, and he's going to tell you more, but he's, a, he's more than just a, a good speaker. He's an incredible speaker, but he's, a, he's an amazing guy, and, and I love how honest he is, and you're going to get a little shocked. I mean, you're going you're gonna to go, whoa. Because he's real and he's honest. Do you guys want real or do you want, do you want weird? Okay. All right. So here we go. This is my friend Craig Scott. Could you give it up for him? Yes. Thank you. And if you'll also pray for me because I have to travel with Mike. And I don't know if you've seen some of his antics, like coming up here while your pastor's on the piano and, mo you know, kind of mimicking him. And I have to deal with that like 24-7. He also snores really loud at sleep. But I want to thank... Oklahoma for their Oklahoma hair air. He hasn't snored at all in Chewy or last night in the hotel room. I actually slept. I've literally, uh, this is not an exaggeration. I've stood up near, like next to his bed and threw pillows at his face hard and he would not wake up. And I literally would get no sleep. And I'm like, God, what am I? I got to, we got to speak at 7 a.m. tomorrow. What am I? It's like, oh, I'll make you more emotional because you can't sleep and you'll probably cry. So I want to share with you today a story, a true story. 
And I have a few, uh, just a couple of messages for you and, and, and some words that I felt to give to this congregation today. But um, I'm going to, I'm not here to focus on a tragedy, but I do want to uh, ask, uh, how many of you remember the day that Columbine happened? Remember where you were and what you were doing? Um, it was a day in our, in our history um, that was a sad day. And, and today we hear of tragedies, we hear of shootings, and it's commonplace in our news. Uh, but when this happened, it was a shock across our country. It happened in a good town, at a good school, and people didn't understand why. And then the next week on, on the front cover of Time Magazine, it said in big capital letters, why? Why? And we began to see more and more of these shootings happen in school. And now it's almost become a formula in the psyche of American of Americans in, in schools and kids in schools that if you're picked on or bullied at school, an option is to shoot up your school. That's a really poor formula in our psyche. But I wanna, I wanna start off by actually taking you back to this day a little bit. Again, I'm not here to focus on a tragedy, but I wanna take you back to, and, and, and for you guys that weren't, don't remember and weren't born when Columbine happened, it was just a very sad day in our country and you can ask your parents you know exactly where they will tell you exactly where they were and what they were doing because it was just a day in our nation's history that time kind of stopped. But I want to share with you that there's something that's amazing that's come from this tragedy that a lot of people don't know about. A lot of people do because it's a story that's gotten out a lot of places. But uh, if you'd play that first video for me, it starts off with my sister. She's actually filming a little bit for her uh, video for her class. And then it's going to take you back to the worst day of my life, but also the best day of my life. And, and I'm going to share with you why I can say that, if you'll play that first video. Try to calm yourself here. I know that what you've seen must be sh must be shocking. Who did you see with guns? Under the table, kids. Heads under the table. We need police help. Okay. Now we're looking at one of the injured being brought to one of the four area hospitals. Ever seen him before? I didn't see him. I just saw guns and big black cape or, you know, jacket. And the principal came running around the corner and told us to get in the gym. They shot my friend in the knee. We thought, you know, it was just like a little prank or something. It was a paintball gun. We looked at his knee and he said, Paint paintballs don't make that much pain. I saw one of my friends, good friends, his face blowing off. Another freshman or some young kid shot in the back. Everyone around me got shot and I begged him for 10 minutes not to shoot me. Thank you very much. Please be seated. There has been a terrible shooting at a high school in Littleton, Colorado. Please, please let him be on this bus. Craig was where he was in a state of shock and trauma. His eyes were like glazed. It was like he didn't know where he was or what was going on around him. When we were finally home, the horror of things just started pouring out. I went into the uh, library to go do some homework. Before I could even take out my stuff, we heard uh, fireworks. I was joking around about it and treated it like, a, like it was some kind of prank. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got I just still didn't think it was real. I still thought, I thought the teacher was in on uh, it or something that just didn't seem real. That's when the two uh, tall kids with trench coats on, they came into the library. They said, get anybody with a white hat on. I was wearing a white hat and I threw it under my shirt. 
and they were uh, harassing students before they shot him. Isaiah tried to back up, and the last thing that Isaiah heard in his life were racial slurs being made against him. Then they shot uh, my friend uh, Matt also. I, I just ended up laying on the floor. I, I was I was praying to God. He told me to uh, he told me to get out of there. God told me to get out of there. We ran out of the library, and soon after, the two shooters came back to the library. And I realized that more of us could have been killed if that voice didn't speak to me. All these people that I was praying for, 30 minutes later, their brothers and sisters were showing up. But not your sister. One of the things that I was taught just by my father who uh, was a pastor when I was younger was um, that God does have a plan, that he has a purpose behind things and that he is sovereign. And there's a scripture verse that I knew even, before, even at, during this time and uh, it talks about seeing through things with a single lie of faith. And it says if your vision is dual, it is full of darkness, but if you, if you're vision is single, if you can see all through, through all things in your life with faith, good things or bad things, you can see through an invisible hand behind it all composing a, a beautiful yet bittersweet symphony. It was very hard after the shooting and I dealt with a lot of things. Um, and the biggest thing that I dealt with though was anger. I hated those two shooters and I used to fantasize how I'd get revenge on them. I've been asked a lot of times why I thought Columbine happened or why I think I get interviewed a lot on news media when shootings happen. And uh, I learn a little bit about each one and uh, I've been asked a lot why Columbine happened. And a lot, the media painted a picture that it was bullying, that it, these kids were bullied really bad and that they were going to get revenge. And that's the reason. And it wasn't the reason. It wasn't the reason, and the people that knew the shooters knew that, and the people that went to my school knew that. I knew that, that that wasn't the real reason. Yeah, they were bullied to a degree. There were kids that were bullied on worse, but that wasn't what the real story was. And um, the real story, I sum it up in something simple that I've kind of simplified. I call the essence of destiny. And I'm, I know you've heard this, but it's simply that thoughts lead to words, lead to actions, lead to habits, lead to character, and lead to your destiny and the legacy that you leave behind. And the thoughts of the shooters, the last couple years of their life, if you look at their journals and you talk to their friends and you see videos of them, their thoughts were in the, in the, in the mud. They were in the dirt. They focused on a lot of negative things over the internet, through movies, music, games. They dwelled on a lot of very negative stuff through the media, and it really started to warp their thinking and kind of made them delusional. And they watched a certain movie over 100 times, a uh, very violent movie, and they began to refer to the day of the shooting as, as, the, as that day, the name of the movie. They would say, and I'm not gonna say what the movie was, but they, they trained themselves. And when they came into the library where I was, they had no feeling. They, were, they treated it like it was a game. They came over to where I was. I had a friend next to me that was African-American, that was black. And uh, there were very few black students at my school. And so one of, one of their influences was, was Hitler. They had uh, kind of idolized Hitler a little bit. So when they saw Isaiah, they began to, one of them called the other one over and said, hey, we have an N-word over here. And they dragged under Isaiah out from underneath the table and they were calling him racial slurs. And he tried to back up and the last thing that I heard him say was, I wanna see my mom. And they took his life and then they took my friend Matt's life and they had no feeling why they did it. They treated it like it was a game. The last person that they shot was a girl and the shotgun kicked back and hit Eric, who was kind of the leader in the nose. He started to bleed. And he turned his gun to another girl, and he just froze. 
And he was there for a moment, and then, and then he left the library, and the other one followed. And the psychologists say that they believe that the reason he didn't shoot that other person was because the gun kicked, when the gun kicked back and hit his nose and he started to bleed and he felt pain, he smelled his own blood and he felt pain, all of a sudden it was real. And he felt somewhat of what he was inflicting. We have compassion for, for what we feel, for what we've been through, what we feel. And so he left. Uh, they left the library. They shortly returned, and in that meantime, I felt like I heard God speak to me the strongest moment in my life, and it was almost like he was there with me physically. I was so scared. I, my ears were ringing so loud from the shotgun blast, I thought they were bleeding. So I didn't know that they had left the library. And my heart, I felt like it was gonna start, stop beating. I was feeling that much fear, like I couldn't handle it. And so I prayed and I asked God to take away my fear. And in that moment, I felt him, I felt him relieve me of my fear. And I, could, I felt like I could move and think. And I heard a voice very clearly. And it was a very uh, wise, very uh, loving voice that simply said, get out of there. It wasn't my typical inner voice that I heard. It was something different. And said, get out of there. That's all it told me to do was get out of there. And so I listened to that voice. I was the first student in the library to get up. I looked around. I yelled at everyone, let's get out of here. Let's go. And uh, people were crying. Kids were moaning that had been shot. And I heard someone asking for help. And behind a, me, behind a table, was a girl that had her, her, her shoulder blown off by a shotgun blast. And she was asking for help. And I helped to pick her up. And we ran out of the library. Exit, emergency exit. There's a police car outside. We all ran running for our lives and got behind that police car. As soon as we got behind that police car, the two shooters came back to the library. And then they began to exchange gunfire with the police. And I realized right then that God had saved my life and that we got out of there just in time. There was police cars that began to come by and pick up uh, students from that, from that police car and take them to a nearby street. Right before I left, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think there's a girl that's been shot over there. And I looked out from behind the police car and I couldn't see who it was, who he was talking about. All I could see was a backpack and I'm very glad I couldn't see who it was. And then a police car came and picked us up and took us to a nearby street. The first thing I did, we didn't have cell phones then. I got on someone's landline and I called my mom, and the first words out of my mouth were, Mom, I'm okay, but I think there's something wrong with Rachel. I went to a big school. I didn't hear anything about her. I just, it just came out of my mouth. And uh, went home, and it took a whole night um, before we got word from the police that Rachel was the first one that was killed. She was killed right outside the school library. And... Um, I realized that the person that my friend was pointing at, of, some, of someone that had been shot, the girl that had been shot that I couldn't see was Rachel. My dad wrote, out, wrote on her memorial cross after the shooting, your death was so meaningful and full of purpose and your death will not be in vain. And I believe God had a plan with Rachel that we didn't realize all the things that she had been praying and writing in her journal the year before her death. My sister had a premonition, a feeling about her life and a prophetic feeling that she was not going to live to be very old. She never told it to me, but she told it to one of my sisters, my cousins, and a number of her friends. This feeling that she had that God was going to use her in a big way to impact millions of lives, but at the same time that she wasn't gonna live old enough to get married. And she, she wrote this down, and she told a number of my family and friends. And um, she began to write in her journals in, in her prayer life and at, through youth group. Uh, after youth group, she would write down things, in her, in, that she was, things that were going on within her soul. And we took these journals, and we created a school program called Rachel's Challenge that reaches a lot of schools. And we share some of these journals with kids, and they're really challenged by things that she has to talk about. She talks a lot about compassion 
and stepping out of your way for other people and starting it, what she called a chain reaction of kindness. And she said, you never know how far a little bit of kindness can go. And that's the kind of person that she was at my school. She reached out to kids that were on the outside. And you, you say good things about somebody, and you should, after they, after they pass away. But we received so many stories of things that she had done for others. When I was in school, I didn't care about kindness or compassion. I was on the wrestling team. I cared about trying to be cool. I cared about my hair, how good my hair looked. I don't know if you can tell, but it's absolutely perfect. And um, I used to carry around a big comb. I cared about my image at school. Popularity, trying to be popular or trying to be cool was very important to me. That was what was important. And that wasn't important at all to Rachel. She reached out to a kid uh, with disability at her school that was getting picked on a lot. She sat uh, at lunch with people that sat alone. The day the shooting happened, she actually got invited. And I know she wanted to be liked by these girls. They told me um, that they invited her out to lunch at the mall. And she chose not to go. Instead, she had lunch with a kid who was not cool at her school, who was, uh, his parents had just gotten a divorce. And she was, chose to have lunch with him sitting outside in the grass right outside the school library. I want to share with you uh, 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 some of her writings and some of her journals. Um, and so if you play my uh, next video that I have. One of the first things we found that Rachel wrote was an essay for a fifth period class. The words in that essay reflected the same things we heard at her funeral as we listened to her friends talk about how she had treated them and how she had reached out to them. There was so much depth to what she had to say. I knew she was deep, but she had so much more going on in her writings than I knew as a sister. Don't let your character change color with your environment. Find out who you are and let it stay its true color. She just was one of those people that felt deeply and she wrote what she felt and she didn't censor it like the rest of us do through, well, is this gonna sound crazy? Does this make sense? Glory only comes when one pursues their dreams. How many of us know what we really want and go after it? How many of us have enough trust, strength, and faith to believe that we could do the impossible? I don't have time to share all, uh, uh, all of her writings that I normally share, uh, but there's a book called Rachel's Tears that my parents wrote. Uh, it has all of her story in there and all of her writings. And then if you go see the movie, it's called I'm Not Ashamed. It'll be in theaters October 21st. You'll get to hear more of her writings in that. And I think it's going to be a, a great movie for churches, for the church, and uh, it's going to be a good movie. Um, she had this feeling that she wasn't gonna be, live to be very old, but we found a theme in her journals and it was, God used me to reach the unreached. Mike started, how I know Mike Donahue is he started a youth group and then he left uh, and, and, and the youth group that he started, Rachel and I then started attending. And how many of you uh, may have heard of uh, Cassie Bernal? She was a girl that, there was a book called She Said Yes that was written about her story. Michael W. Smith wrote a song called This Is Your Time. Um, Mike actually uh, was, gave the, the, was the youth pastor at the youth retreat that she gave her life to Christ to. She was uh, another victim. She was into witchcraft and all kinds of evil things and negative things and gave her heart to God at, at the retreat that Mike put on. And um, at this youth group, she, I would watch her go down to the front altar at the end, and I wanted to leave early and get out of there, and I would watch her praying and crying for people. And how many of you know there's, there's power in prayer? There really is. There, when you take the time, I like to go for a walk sometimes, but you become powerful. Or the power that's really already existing there is, is it's almost like you're taking the blocks out of the way and you have authority in, spiritual, in, 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 in a spiritual realm when you connect with that, that part of yourself, when you connect with that, 
that spirit, that Holy Spirit, it, in, it empowers you. So if you've never been big on prayer or you, you just think it's just mere talking, it's not. It, it's a, it's a, it is a, an empowering thing in your life. Rachel um, prayed a lot and she was given little glimpses, not in detail, but of something that was going to come. Rachel's story is now the, the biggest story that is told in public schools today. There are 30 speakers that travel full time. About three and a half million students every year hear her story. So at, like I read Anne Frank's books in school and my parents read their, her books in school and know her story. Rachel's like a modern day Anne Frank. Kids read her journals in schools. There's quotes of hers and, and murals engraved on walls in schools. And I'm, I'm saying that because I believe the ingredients were there for God to take this young person and build a platform that was going to reach so many schools. And uh, her story has stopped over a dozen school shootings. I have a book of over 500 emails from students, emails of students, just students that were thinking of taking their own life, that were, had plans to take their life, 500 that heard her story and gave them hope to hold on, gave them, empowered them to hold on. She didn't know all of that was going to happen, but she had a feeling that God was gonna use her in a big way. When she was 12 years old, she outlined her hands on the back of an old dresser and in the center of one of those hands wrote, these hands belong to Rachel Joy Scott and will someday touch millions of people's hearts. On a Christmas day, five years after the shooting, we were moving some furniture around in my house and we turned this dresser around and saw this drawing for the first time, five years after. By that time, what she had written had come true. A person that was praying, a person that was on, like on the insignia, on the, on the beret for, so that others may live. That's where her heart was. So God said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take her, I'm gonna honor her prayer. Her prayer over and over was use me to reach the unreached. Use me to un reach the unreached. And if she had a choice to live to be uh, uh, 77 or 17, she wouldn't come back because her dream of being used to impact so many came, came true through her death. Jesus' death was, was a tragedy and... and um, it is true that, that God can take those things and he has a great plan and purpose. So Rachel had this feeling about her life and uh, I wanna play my next video that kind of shows as the shooters are planning a little bit, you can see in her writings and what she said, what she said to friends about this premonition that she had. New evidence of just how troubled Columbine killers Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were. The pair had left a carefully planned video diary. When I first saw the web pages, I was utterly blown away. He's not saying like he's gonna beat me up. He's saying he wants to blow me up. Hey, I'm making pipe bombs. I've got the designs for them on my website. Um, I'm going to kill these people, here's why. That's a level beyond making a joke. I just remember uh, Rachel saying she wasn't, you know, going to, um, she was going to die at a young age, is what she said. Eric wrote, we will be in all black, dusters, black army pants. It'll be like the LA riots, the Oklahoma bombing, World War II, Vietnam, all mixed together. They wanted to uh, harm as many people as they could. Um, I think their plans were very grandiose and um, they were gonna take it as far as they could take it. Just out of the blue, she goes, I'm gonna die young. And we looked at her like, why do you say that? And she's like, I just think I'm gonna die young. I thought she's just being dramatic, you know? <laughs> but, um... She knew she was gonna die young. She knew she was gonna change the planet, and in the end, exactly what she did. What 
was she feeling? Why didn't she feel like she was going to live to be very old? Our first true pipe bombs blew big, Harris writes. God, I can't wait till I can kill you people. Fantasizing that their attack would spark wider violence, with Harris saying, we need an effing kickstart. We need to get a chain reaction going here. My codes may seem like a fantasy that can never be reached, but test them for yourself and see the kind of effect they have in the lives of people around you. You may just start a chain reaction. I'm coming for everyone soon, and I will be armed to the teeth, and I will kill everything. Please reach out your hand. Grab a hold of their life. Don't let go without a good fight. If we can spend that time in prayer, if we can spend that time connected, there are glimpses that God can give us of things to come. There is a preparation and a training that can happen. And spending that time in prayer, in worship that Rachel did, I think gave her, gave her this feeling, gave her a preparation, a sense of preparation. And you'll see even up until the last moments of her life, she was prepared. She was ready. And... Um, I'm not saying that, you know, if I had a gun, I would have stopped the shooters myself that day. But there was, there was something that was happening with her, that God was getting her ready for something. I, uh, I shared with you, I wasn't, I wasn't like my, um, my sister in school. And I, have, um, I just have a word for, for the, the teenagers in the room. Um, I was a, a jock at school, and I cared about trying to be cool and popular. That was what I cared about. And Rachel wasn't cool or popular at school, and she reached out to kids that were on the outside, and I even made fun of her for it. Now I look back, and I see how shallow and how petty, that I, how, how petty I was and how shallow it was to think that those things were important, and I have so much respect for my sister for having the courage to do the things that she did. And I guess I just wanted to give you guys the challenge to be more like her in school and less like me. Care less about popularity, care less about trying to be cool. I get we all, just so you know, every kid in school cares about that, that everybody wants to be well liked. But she wrote something down to a friend. She said, don't let your character change color with your environment. Find out who you are and let it stay its true color. In the end, you will win people's respect more with really sticking to who you are. Finding out who you are and let it stay in its true color. And if you, if you have God in your life and you, and, you, and, you get to, and you get to talk to him, and then part of, your, part of who you are, a big part of who you are is, is, like Mike said, it's God's kid. That's part of your identity. That's a huge thing to come back to. And it's a thing that I have to come back to a lot, especially when I'm in sin or messing up or not living right. Especially then, I get to come back to I'm, I'm God's kid and that's who I am. And it changes the way I feel and think about myself. So I just want to give you guys a challenge that if you get the chance to step out in compassion, if you get a chance to step out for somebody, somebody that sits all alone or and start a chain reaction of kindness, as Rachel would, would call it. I want to give you guys that challenge to do that. So that was my word for you guys today. I, um, like Mike, I've been speaking in schools for a long time, and I, uh, I had an anointing on me at one point. I felt where I, it was really having a big impact, and, and, and uh, Mike can tell you, uh, but then I, uh, I started to become uh, kind of a little bit of a uh, desired speaker, and I started to have a change of attitude. I started not to be very appreciative of things. I was v becoming successful and very sought, off, sought after with conferences and schools for youth. And I started to get kind of a bratty and sort of an, an, an entitled. I'd want my flights a certain way, and I, if I didn't like a hotel, and I started to get... Um, kind of entitled. Anybody uh, run into any entitlement now, nowadays? <laughs> I started to become that way. I actually um, uh, was let go in 2012 from an organization I helped to build. My, my own father fired me 
in 2012 from Rachel's challenge because of this entitlement that he saw. Because he cared more about my character, he let me go. And um, the reason I wanted to share that with, with you today is I've gone through now the last couple of years kind of eating some humble pie and I've not had people booking me to speak and I've had a very slow time in my life and I kind of fell off into um, a lot of sin and got, and got off. And the biggest thing that I had struggled with uh, last few years has been lust in my life and got really off track. And even when I came back to speaking, I, I, I felt that that same anointing wasn't there and the same change that I would see take place that I'd seen for a decade, it wasn't there. And the reason I felt to be vulnerable and honest with you about all my junk here on the stage today, and I don't wanna treat this like my confession stand, but was that I felt to give a word to people that are blessed right now, people that are blessed and are doing good. And my word for you is to start to show more appreciation to others. That was it. I prayed about it. To show more appreciation, it's part of my story right now, to show more appreciation to others. If you're doing well in life and doing good and you're successful and things are just good, my challenge to you today is to show that appreciation. Even if you don't feel it or, or, or feel like showing it or feel like you need to show it, just show it. Show the appreciation to others. Um... I know it's a little random, some of my messaging, and maybe it doesn't have one solid theme, but uh, I had just had a few words to share today. Um, the biggest thing I struggled with after Columbine was anger, and I used to fantasize what I would do to those shooters if I could take revenge on them. I was uh, sitting in a chair one day uh, watching a movie with my brother who was sitting on a couch, and it, this scene broke out in the movie, very violent scene, uh, prisoners were breaking out of prison. And this is shortly, this is a year after the shooting. And I started to have flashbacks of being in the library. I witnessed people dying and I started having these flashbacks. And I told my brother to change a channel and my brother wouldn't change a channel. He just watched a movie, he's not thinking anything of it. And I started to think about the two shooters and I started to think about what I would do to them. And I started to get very negative. And it was like a, a black cloud started to envelop me. And I told my brother, change a channel. And he wouldn't change a channel. And again, I just kept sitting in this, sitting in this victim mentality and sitting in this hurt and pain and anger. And I told my brother a final time, I said, change a channel. And just carelessly, he said, why? And I went and I grabbed my little brother that I, I love very much and I carried him in the kitchen. I slammed him on the kitchen floor and I grabbed the kitchen knife and put it in front of his face and I said, do you want to know what it feels like to almost lose your life? My brother was crying. I wasn't thinking about my brother at all. I was thinking about those shooters. The anger and the hurt and the pain that I was holding on to was making me like the shooters. I believe what you place your attention on, you give power to. And I was giving a lot of power to them at that time in my life. That summer, uh, Ron Luce from Teen Mania heard that Rachel wanted to go to um, Africa for a missions trip and she didn't get to go. So he offered me a trip to go with Teen Mania to South Africa for two months. And so I went on this trip and it changed my life. Going to a third world country we had an uh, African driver, big guy, jolly guy, who was always singing these African songs and hymns, who would take us into these poor squatter camps, these refugee camps, where whole families lived in little sheds that were half the size of my room back home, and would have one meal a day. It really changed my perspective. I was up one, one night, and I was feeling uh, just negative about Columbine. And the African driver uh, noticed me and, he, and he, said, he said, tell me your story. And so I told him what happened. I told him everything that had happened at Columbine and he listened 
And then I'll never forget with a smile, not a, not a fake smile, but a genuine smile, he told me his story. He said that he came home to his village one day, and this is during the apartheid in South Africa, and found that his whole village had been slaughtered, brutally slaughtered, and that 17 members of his family had been killed. His wife and his children, all of his relatives, he was the only person left of his family. And as I, as I saw, as I heard him tell me this, I was shocked because this was the same man that was filled with so much life, who was filled with a joy and love and a person you wanted to be around, had been robbed of everything. And he was the person you wanted to be around. And he said, he told me that forgiveness was like setting a prisoner free and finding out that that prisoner is you. And I was like, I want to be like this guy. I came back from that trip and my family said I was different. I was different not only because I had a change of perspective on how blessed I was, but I had a letting go of my anger and hurt. And all of us have to practice that. If you're in the room and you've been hurt by usually the people that are closest to you and you're holding on to that hurt, you're holding on to that right to be angry, I understand that. But we're, as people of faith, are, are to be people that let that go, to let that right to be angry, that right that you have that's, ju maybe that's justified to having, God says, to give it away. So if you are holding on to something, I want to challenge you to let go because it does free you. It, you will be like that prisoner being freed from something. I want to end with um, uh, one more word and one uh, last video. And, well, actually, uh, two, two more words. Um, the first I have is, is difficult for me to say, but um, I told you that what, what the biggest thing that I've struggled with after kind of my downfall has been lust. And I had, I had felt to share a word for anyone that's dealing with that in this room. And there's two things I felt strongly to share. I have a friend named Kyle Maynard. He was born with no arms and no legs. He is a champion, national champion in wrestling. He has climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. He could, if he were on this stage on his, on his nubs, he could beat me up. <laughs> He's a warrior. He's a champion. And he has a champion spirit. And he told me once, no excuses. He wrote a book called No Excuses, so that helps to be his motto, but he told me no excuses. And that's what I wanted to share with, with you, is, is don't give yourself excuse to give in to that lust. Don't get your, give yourself excuses. Be it a hard day, you're tempted, don't give in. Because there's a second thing I wanted to tell you. When you do, you're trading in. And that's what I wanted, and, and, and if you do, do give in to lust, this is what I want you to think about the next time, <laughs> think about me, right, when you're giving in to lust. But I want you to think about this, and that is, and it literally, I, God's, in my spirit at least, I felt to tell you, it's okay. It's okay that you're gonna give in to lust. Go ahead and give in to it, it's okay. But when you do, just think about this. Just, just be, have a knowing, have a conscious knowing that you're trading in what you want right then for what God has for you. Just have that knowing when lust calls, when lust tempts. Just say, okay, even if I give in to this, it's okay. God loves me and tomorrow and there's new mercies and there's forgiveness and there's plenty of grace for you, I promise you. And he'll surprise you even with goodness. But you still are trading in a little bit. You're trading in, not a little bit, but you're trading in. So that, those were my two words. And my last word is just for anybody that's faced, facing or faced a tragedy or loss. And it would, it would be to have that single eye of faith. It's to be a see-througher. It's to see through the, the bad in your life and the good in your life, the problems, and see that God is sovereign, that he has a master plan, that he has a, a purpose with your pain. And that 
if you can see through, like it's in Revelations, talks about seeing with a single eye of faith, that you'll see, and it becomes a beautiful yet bittersweet symphony. And if you can have that kind of faith, I have friends that went through Columbine that went down the wrong path and became bitter and held on to all that anger and still are, some of them medic, self-medicated. Some of them went off on uh, into causes that were kind of ne- negative and b- pointing blame at people and things like that. But, if, but I am thankful for the faith that I had to be able to see through behind it all that there was a purpose. I'd like to end with this video um, about my sister's last moments of her life. Many of her writings also seemed equally inspired. A letter Rachel wrote to a friend exactly one year to the day before she died spoke of sacrifice. It's like I have a heavy heart and this burden upon my back, but I don't know what it is. She said now that she's begun to, quote, walk her talk, some of her friends at school had rejected her for that. But you know what? It's all worth it to me. She said if I have to sacrifice have to sacrifice everything, everything I will. Every time Sarah saw her that morning, Rachel was concentrating on only one thing, drawing a picture in her journal. This picture would soon speak volumes. I saw her in the morning, and um, she was sitting there drawing in her journal. And then in math class, it was something confusing. It always was to me. So I was looking, and then I look over at her. She sat, like, to my left. And she was drawing in her journal, and I was thinking, Rachel, why aren't you paying attention? This is confusing. And she just wasn't even paying attention at all. She was just drawing in her journal. And then we had acting a couple periods later, and again she was drawing in her journal. When class was over, before she went to lunch, Rachel showed her acting teacher, Sue Carruthers, the drawing. On April 20th, 1999, the day that Rachel died, approximately 10 minutes before the end of the class period, I saw her drawing, and I asked her about it. And she said to me, well, Mrs. Carruthers, it's not finished, but I was inspired to draw this. And I said, Rachel, it's absolutely amazing. Would you explain it? And she said, well, it's just my tears. I'm crying. Then she looked at me and said, Mrs. Carruthers, I'm going to be an impact on the world. And I looked back at her and said, Rachel, I have no doubt of that. When the shooters approached the school, these were the stairs that they walked up. And when they got to the top of the stairs, that's when they saw Rachel. They shot her from a distance. The only witness to Rachel's death was Richard Castaldo, who was eating with her outside when the shooting began. Bullets tore through Richard's spine, paralyzing him. Rachel was hit in the legs and torso and tried to crawl to safety. Richard heard her crying and recounted her last moments in the hospital afterward. She uh, was mocked for her faith. They knew her, they had a class with her. And the last moment of her life was Eric picked her up by her hair and said, you still believe in God. And she said, you know I do. And he said, well, go be with him. And she took her final shot. This is the drawing that she put in her journal. She drew this just in half an hour before she was killed. It's a picture of her eyes crying 13 tears, watering a rose with drops of blood coming off from it, America's national flower. Within one hour of her drawing this picture, there were 13 victims that were killed at Columbine. If you would, uh, I want to get you to imagine something for a moment as a close. If you'd just close your eyes for just a moment. I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I've wasted a lot of potential in my life. I'm not the man of God that I should be. I've fallen 
way short. But I have a desire in my heart, and maybe you do too, to be used by God to help others. And to, to live out my purpose and reach more of my potential and make an impact in this world because they need it. Because this world needs you. It needs you. And if you don't do some of the things that you're meant to do, it's missing out. The world is missing out. People are missing out. As you look at this next week, I want you to have a champion spirit, a Kyle Maynard spirit, that you are a child of God and that you walk this earth with spiritual authority that was given to you, not by your own doing or merit, but that was given to you and that you have and that you should use boldly. And as you go into work to do your work and you interact with your coworkers and your boss, as you go into school and you see kids in the hallway and in during class or at a party or on social media, that a word of kindness would be there. Like Rachel, you would start a chain reaction that would ripple around, that would touch one person's life and go to the next and go to the next. I pray that you wouldn't be people that give in to mere things like mere men, the men in the room that lust wouldn't own you and rob you would steal your lunch. It'll steal your strength and steal, steal your drive and desire. But that you would have a no excuses, I'm not trading in what I want in this moment for what God has for me. For the people that are hurting, you're hurting right now. That there is hope, there's hope. And if you can see through, be a see-througher you will see a hand composing a beautiful yet bittersweet symphony. If you're a person that is holding on to anger and hurt, right now in this moment, I wanna ask you to let it go and to give it to God. It's got a chain around you and right now to be freed from that chain. I wanna invite Mike up and keep your eyes closed as, for a moment until Mike says to open them, but I want to invite him to give us some closing words. Hallelujah. Thank you.